one. Hi everyone, welcome to Chavista Chronicles from Caracas. Today we have the pleasure to interview Mark Borton. Mark Borton is a human rights lawyer from the United States and member of the national leadership of the U.S. Peace Council. He is the legal representative of Simón Trinidad, a combatant of the former FARC insurgency in Colombia, who was illegally extradited from Colombia to the U.S. Borton was a close observer of the Colombian peace process in Havana and now joins uh, uh, the struggle of the Venezuelan people against the U.S. blockade and interventionism. So, um, welcome, uh, Mark, uh, and thanks Thank for accepting the invitation. Uh, the, 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 what we usually do is that I will ask you four questions, and at the end, if you want, you can ask one or two questions, and I will gladly answer them. So the first question, of course, uh, is about, I, I want you to update us about the Simon Trinidad case. So tell us what are the latest news and the new strategy in relation to the, you know, a force to free Simon Trinidad from uh, uh, his political incarceration in the U.S. Yeah, maybe I should uh, give a little brief uh talk about who he is for people in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. um, he's more famous in the Spanish speaking world, but um, yes, uh, Simon Trinidad was uh, extradited in the United States at the end of 2004. Um, uh, and uh, uh, based on some trumped up charges, some drug charges, just like other people in Latin America, the United States is as part of their sanctions as part of their way to manipulate um, uh, politics in, internally in, in other countries. Uh, made some uh, false allegations of drug trafficking, and then they also uh, tacked on a, a case of, uh, of uh, uh, kidnapping, which really was also false. He was a spokesman for the FARC, and they, 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 they eventually, after four trials, convicted him of a conspiracy charge, and he was sentenced, uh, which was very unfair. He never had anything to do with the the three the three Americans who were. Uh, held by the FARC who, who had actually been spying on Colombia and spying on the FARC and, and sending uh, videos to the U.S. military in Florida. So they weren't uh, innocent civilians. They were uh, involved in an internal armed conflict in Colombia. And um, Simon Trinidad was a spokesman for them um, in certain aspects, mainly on questions of peace. He was a very famous uh, uh, peace negotiator in the Caguan, uh, San Vicente del Caguan talks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very, um, he was very um, prominent, uh, mainly for his, uh, his being a spokesperson, not for being a combatant, but he, uh, but anyway. So during, um, during the peace process, and I went to uh, Havana three times, um, there was hope that somehow the between uh, the peace process and the Colombian government and the United States government, that they'd find a solution for him to go back home. Um, and there's, there were some hopes and there were some sort of subtle promises made, but in the end, uh, the United States did not send him back. And in the end, the Colombian government really uh, didn't put up enough effort uh, to get him back there. Um, sure. So we, our campaign is to, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's mo mostly a political campaign um, uh, hoping for a political solution to this problem of this person who was really kidnapped from Colombia with the connivance of the Colombian government at the time, which is Uribe, you know, the same guy who's now in jail or home jail. Uh, he's the one who uh, cooked up all these charges. Uh, and it's interesting, um, when he, he was, uh, my client was originally captured in Ecuador, and then when they brought him back to Bogota, two, two days later, uh, the Uribe government was asking the U.S. Embassy to extradite him. The U.S. Embassy responded, we don't have any charges. How can we extradite him? There are no charges against him. Well, they went to work and uh, cooked up some charges. So um, we're, you know, we're still, we're hoping for a political solution um, like there are, have been in other cases um, uh, with uh, political prisoners like uh, Simon Trinidad. And we are trying to, um, we are trying to, uh, give his case a lot of prominence. Yes, um, recently, uh, we had a 
a digital protest. Right now it's kind of difficult because of the COVID. Yeah. But we had a digital protest, a worldwide digital protest, um, asking on his 70th birthday, yes. um, uh, asking people to call for his freedom. And we had a tremendous response. I mean, really. I mean, we had, I think just in Colombia, there were 10,000 tweets asking for the freedom for Simon Trinidad. Nice to hear that. Half of them were from, um, were from our uh, hashtag, the one we had here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then there was 5,000 from other, under other hashtags. So he was one of the most uh, tweeted persons on, the, on that day. And we also had uh, messages of support for, from, I would say, 20 to 30 political parties around the world, from Russia to all the way to you know, Argentina America. and Chile and Venezuela, everywhere. So that's what we're working on now is a political solution for him. Um, and really the best time of this to happen was during the peace process and it didn't, um, but we're still working on that. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that's where we are in the campaign right now. When, unfortunately, we, well, I don't want to say too much, but we have a, a government that may not be too receptive to it right now. Um, and we also have a government in Colombia who may not be too receptive to it right now. But uh, there's, in, the, in other cases, there have been prisoner exchanges, there's been, you know, people released uh, in, in talks between governments. And that's what we're hoping. We have an election here, and in Colombia, they're going to have an election in a year. And we're hoping that the, the political situation uh, improves for him. But we're not going to stop. Whatever the political situation is, we're going to keep working for his freedom, because it's very unfair what's happened to him. And the United States is really keeping him under sort of uh, most extreme conditions. Yes. in a supermax prison where he is cut off from the world, where he's uh, the virtually solitary confinement. He, he does have some interaction with other people for an hour or two a day, um, two hours a day, actually. And, um, and that's what we're hoping for. So we're going to continue, and we're going to have another one soon, and we'll announce it, and we'll let Orinoco Tribune know as well yes, so that you yes. can help us uh, put out the information. We, we participated in the last one that you mentioned. We try to make noise around the, the case because we believe it's important. Uh, and I was, I, I wanted to uh, ask a que an additional question about what you are saying. And, uh, and what you are saying reminds me of the Q15 case. And I was in the US uh, doing, uh, for several years, and the Q15 case was something that caused my attention since the, since the beginning. Even though I'm from Venezuela, and Venezuela is a country that is very connected, very, have a strong friendship with the Cuba, I learned about the Cuban case in the U.S. because I learned in depth about that case in the U.S. because of the Cuban Five Solidarity Committees that were created all over the U.S. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm commenting about that because uh, I want to ask you if you haven't seen him do something like that in the case of Simon Trinidad, like creating uh, Simon Trinidad committees in different cities. Uh, I'm not expecting to, to have uh, like, like all the all the cities in the U.S., like the Cuban Five, like like tens of cities in the U.S. But have you think about that possibility? Like yes, like, like like a mass uh, organized solidarity movement or something? Yes, that, that would be excellent. We do have a committee for the freedom of Simon Trinidad, and at least in the in in Latin America, he's very well known. Uh, but in the United States, maybe not well known enough. Yes. So that's something that we should consider uh, how to spread uh, the solidarity movement for him around the country. And there's yes. a, we've also had a lot of uh, uh, support from Europe as well. Uh, from, I said, Russia, Germany, uh, Portugal, Spain, England. Um, so yes, it is something. And the Cuban Five is an example of a political solution. Yes, yes, yes. And, but they had the Cuban government and the United States government talking about it and making some deal. And the, and the education behind the, those committees is key because I, I, what, what I was telling you, I, 
I when I arrived as a Venezuelan diplomat to the U.S., I was like not very clear. I, I didn't understood very well why those Cubans were incarcerated. And at the beginning, I was like, wow, well, they, if, they, they, if the media is saying that they were spying, they, they should be in prison. You know what I mean? I mean, right. they, I mean those committees helped uh, mostly in educating people about the case. And I believe that in the case of Simon Trinidad, that's important because even for me, in the case of Simon Trinidad here in Venezuela and in the U.S. also, uh, while I was there, uh, uh, there were a lot of things that I didn't know. I've been reading and I've been, uh, you know, uh, involving myself in the case of Simon Trinidad. But at the beginning, I was like, wow, okay, they got another, has the media say another guerrilla, another terrorist or drug trafficker or whatever. And they put that in people's head. And if you don't have a, a you know, an educational campaign, uh, people do not pay attention. You know what I mean? Right. You know, th there's another case where the United States was looking to get their prisoner out. And fortunately, eventually, the media um, uh, caught on to what was going on. There was a case of um, Lori Berenson. I don't know if you know her case. I don't recall. Well, <laughs> she was uh, arrested in Peru because she was friendly with the MRTA. Russia. No, she was familiar with the movement, Movimiento Revolucionario Tupaca, Amaru. Okay, okay. And so there were some problems between that group and the government, and uh, etc. And she was arrested. I and she was put in prison. She's she a journalist, in, right? Uh, she was like a young activist when she was arrested, I think. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe she may be I a journalist guess. now, I don't know. Um, but they put her in prison, and then she was in terrible conditions uh, in prison, in the high Andes, you know? Uh, her health was bad, and um, eventually she had a child in prison. Um, but the American press started uh, pressure um, because she got she got a basically a life sentence, cadena uh, perpetua, and um, they started making pressure. And finally, the Clinton government uh, spoke to the made some deal with the Peruvian government. And she eventually she was released after 20 years in prison. Wow. Um, but she was released. I was um, not aware of that case. Yeah. So this is this is the kind of thing uh, the political uh, agreements can uh, can solve these problems sometimes. Yes, and pressure uh, from the outside, from the media, or from committees, things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. In the, in her case, it was in the Cuban Five. It was everything: media, uh, campaign, uh, the, the Cuban government. government. Yes. The Cuban government, they had all that. Um, and hers, it was mostly the press. There wasn't really, that's how they got the uh, in, interest in the case. Was I, the I, know, I know that in the case of Simon Trinidad, there's not Colombian government willing to support a uh, free Simon Trinidad committee or something like that. <laughs> But oh, I'm sure that the Cuban government or the Venezuelan government might, might be like a good sponsor, I, I believe. Uh, to promote a cause like that. So I'm sure that the Cuban and the Venezuelan government, maybe other governments around the world, might be sympathetic to the idea of promoting and helping organize a committee like that because it's important. Yeah. Well, the Cuban government was a, a país garante, a, a guaranteed country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were diplomatically involved. So they have to be very diplomatic because, yeah. you know, it's a diplomatic. But Venezuela was uh, what they call an accompanying country. Yes. So yes. it wasn't really a diplomatic role. It was more like a support role. Yes. Um, yes. So Venezuela would be a good country to, to help do that. So we have to push into that direction our bureaucrats in Casa Amarilla <laughs> <laughs> to help us with that matter. I'm sure that mo a lot of them uh, will be very sympathetic to the idea of doing something more depth in depth about the case of Simon Trinidad. And that takes me to the second question. Right. I want to ask you also, because I hear somewhere that, uh, that you are getting involved in the case of Elis Ramirez Sanchez. Uh, yes. and, and I want you to update us also in that case, because it's, 
also a very political case of uh, uh, very political activists, uh, uh, Venezuelan activists that has been kidnapped in France for almost 30 years, right? Like 26 years or something like that. Uh, what was it, 1992 that he was taken there? I don't mm -hmm. remember. Yes, I think I that remember. should be somewhere around there, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm not uh, officially involved, but I am very interested and I'm willing to help. Uh, I because wish. This is, I this wish is another, you can. This is another case uh, similar to Simon Trinidad where w we could call them an imperialist country or a, a, a Euro Western European yes. or imperialist country, yes. along with the United States, uh, has sort of uh, kidnapped um, uh, a, cit a citizen of Latin America and held him, uh, in this case, very unjustly. Um, the only difference is, is that in the case of Simon Trinidad, the Colombian government of Urebe, the, you know, the guy who's in jail now, yes. uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the guy who was number 84 on the DEA uh, uh, drug uh, traffickers list at one point. Was it number 84? I can't I, remember, 82 I list. Remember. Um, but he, he, yeah, 82, I think. Yeah. Um, he's the one who connived with the U.S. government to send him there. In the case of uh, Illich, it was mainly the French government and the United States government, I think. And he was absolutely kidnapped. There was no due yes. process. Yes. There was no there was no extradition request. Nothing. There was no hearing where he could he could uh, have a defense to the extradition request, such as it's a political charge. Literally the kidnapped. Intelligence. Him. <laughs> the yes. French intelligence went and kidnapped him in Sudan. And, and, so that and, case and they was, announced it like big deal. I mean, they, they, they didn't hide it uh, at no. the time. I mean, they made a, a lot of noise and they were actually happy about announcing the kidnapping of Elis Ramirez in Sudan at that time. Yeah, so the, the whole case was illegal from the start. I mean, right from the beginning. How can you just kidnap somebody and uh, like that and uh, everything that is a fruit of that should be thrown out. He should, his case should have been thrown out. You can't bring, you can't, uh, like in the United States, uh, you know, if you arrest somebody illegally, the evidence that you, you get from his arrest is thrown out if it's illegal, right? Yes. So um, that's the, the problem with him. And he's somebody, uh, for uh, people who don't know, he's somebody who uh, is a Venezuelan citizen, was born in Venezuela from a very uh, uh, well-known family in Venezuela. And a um, uh, very well-educated man. He went to Europe to be educated. But he was very uh, socially conscious. And he had a lot of um, contacts. And he be had a lot, became very interested in the, the suffering of the, of the Palestinian people. Yes. And he became an activist or a militant, or what do you want to talk about it, mm -hmm. for, I believe, the, the, the uh, PFLP, the, uh, the Front for uh, Liberation, the liberation of, Palestine. of Palestine. Yeah. And um, and that's and he became very famous uh, at that uh, due to certain things. Um, but then he was taken to France, and from what I understand, and I hope to learn more. One day I'll go to France and talk to his lawyers, and I hope uh, so. and um, you know, with the COVID, it's kind of difficult. Um, yeah. I know that his, the trial sounded tremendously unfair. First of all, one of his trials, they he had no time to prepare. They just said, we're going to have trial in two weeks or something like that. And he had no oh, chance no. to repair. Yeah, in one of his trials. I, I don't remember. And, it, and the other one, they had him in jail <coughs> far away from Paris. And to go to court, he had to go to court like almost overnight uh, in a van with the police. And so his lawyers had very little access to him. And I, I understand there was a lot of uh, other unfair things about his trials. It was complete. Uh, political uh, uh, show. So I think people can assume that it was sort of a farce and that it was unfair and that it should be, he should be given another, he should be released really. He's been there over 20 years, yes. but at the very least be given another, another trial, even though I think that the French uh, judicial process is now over. There's not uh, nothing to do uh, that's as far as that. That's why uh, like a person like you, that with all the experience that you have with Simon Trinidad might be really helpful. I was very happy when I heard that you might get involved in the case. 
and also in the case of of, of Elise Ramirez, I believe that is also necessary. I believe that we cannot connect the case of Simon Pinedad and, and Elise Ramirez, but at least in the case of Elise Ramirez, we can try also to set up, uh, you know, international committees uh, for the freedom yes. of Elise Ramirez. Uh, in Venezuela, in recent weeks, uh, there has been a lot of media, social media activity of this committee that it has been formed for the liberation and extradition of Iles Ramirez. And they, they have been working hard for the last, I don't know, at least uh, to my knowledge for the last eight, ten weeks. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I believe that they should keep doing that, but also they should keep doing that thinking about organizing an international committee also because I believe that they, and that happened in a lot of places, they, they, they think locally and they, they, they made all their campaigns thinking locally, thinking about getting uh, some awareness inside Venezuela, but uh, that won't change Elis Ramirez's faith if they keep doing that. You know what I mean? I mean, you need to organize an international committee that is capable to organize and educate people outside Venezuela, especially in France and in the U.S., in order to provoke or push towards the desired situation. And in the case of Ilets Ramirez, uh, the case is worse because the media at a time satanized him because they, uh, oh, yes. they, they, they call him the jackal. Uh, they made movies about him killing and kidnapping people. Uh, so so uh, portraying him like the bad guy, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. And he was actually a fighter for the liberation of Palestine. And, and, and that has to be put in, into context because, uh, because the media, in the case of Elisa Ramirez, they satanize him. And I believe that's why the media, when they caught him in Sudan, was like so blatantly happy for the kidnapping of, I mean, for, for his kidnapping. So I don't know what right. you think about that. Oh, I agree with you. Um, I think that uh, his, his case needs to have more, uh, the same thing happened to Simon Trinidad, but the, so there's a lot of dis, di, uh, similarities. And the, there are some differences, but there are a lot of similarities. Uh, he was demonized after the peace talks in Caguan, the government demonized him. He was the worst terrorist. He was a grand leader of the terrorism. He was this, he was that. In fact, mostly he was, um, he, he was a political guy, mostly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, and they, they accused him of all sorts of things. Um, same thing with Ilias uh, Ramirez. They, 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 sat in, they, they demonized him, we call it. They, yeah. de they demonized him and they, 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 they attributed acts that were not true. And apparently that that movie, what's it called, Carlos, because he was known as yes. Commandant and Carlos, uh -huh. is fiction. It's uh, and it was really a, 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 a it was really a, a hatchet job against Elis Ramirez. But I think that the international community should be interested, first of all, because of the legal I illegality of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole thing yes. is it's completely it's 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 a, his trial and, and extras and his it was a total fraud, a legal fraud. Everything was illegal. And I think people in the international community should wake up to that because, yes. but he's been so demonized um, that it's difficult, but we have to do the education, like you said about Simon Trinidad. Yes. We need to do the education. Um, and uh, I know that people in Venezuela are very passionate about his uh, freedom. Yes. I've met a lot of people. Yes. I met his family. Yes. I met his brother anyway. Um, and I, um, I met other people that are I very, haven't. very passionate about his uh, release. And he was, and he was demonized, but he was somebody who was taking up the cause of other people. It wasn't his own benefit he was doing all this for. He was, uh, he's an internationalist. You know, he was an internationalist and a, a solidarity, uh, you know, militant. That's fine. That's fine. Let's see what happened. I hope that you yeah, can jump fine, there and, 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 and help in the case of Elis Ramirez also. The next question that I want to ask yeah. you is about the, the violence in Colombia. I know that because of the work that you have been doing and also because of personal issues, I mean, your, your personal life, you are too connected with Colombia. 
and I wanted to ask you about the recent uh, talking about violence in Colombia is like like a too broad issue. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to ask you about the recent violence, repression in Colombia, and 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 within that, I also want to ask about your opinion on how do you see the public opinion in Colombia, and and and, and why do you, I mean I have the impression that in Colombia, uh, a lot of people uh, are uh, somehow kidnapped by the media or, or afraid maybe to say something and they just decide not to participate in, you know, in political issues. So what, what do you think about what is happening right now in Colombia? Well, uh, I think fear plays a big role in Colombia. Fear, people are scared um, because they have that, uh, uh, the, all that violence. Well, I think it's it's a big shame because uh, in in Havana, uh, when they're doing the peace talks, there was this hope that you know uh, maybe things could change for the better in Colombia, including the violence. And there's even in the agreement that the government agreed to make a fight against par what's called paramilitarism. The the really they're death squads. I mean they're they they operate outside of the law, but at the same time they're paramilitaries. They cooperate with certain sectors of the military and the Colombian political class. You know, they're not completely divorced from the government. So you have this violence. And as we know, uh, with the Caguan peace, uh, peace talks, uh, no, the Caguan, the one, the, the one with El Esario Betancourt in El, El Meta in the 80s, after that, they, the, the FARC formed and other groups, they formed this uh, political party called the Union Patriotica, the Patriotic Union. And there was a massive wave of violence against them. And they, I think the, the, the estimates are between four and 5,000 people were killed. I remember and There was that. assassinations, people had to leave the country. Uh, and uh, it, it was terrible. And uh, the government, in the Colombia was supposed to take a fight against paramilitarism to make Colombia a safer place. And they haven't done it. Um, I think since the peace uh, uh, the peace ag agreement was ratified in the in the in the by the Colombian government in November of 2016, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many exactly how many uh, uh, ex combatants have been killed. It's over like 230, 240 um, have been assassinated, um, and over like a thousand uh, what they call social leaders, which would be leaders of peasants groups or or, or Last activists, week. social mm -hmm. activists. So, yeah, it, it's 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 just it's just almost the same thing over with the Union Patriotica. I mean, maybe not quite as uh, as 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 That's large and, and and violent, but how can you have a how can you have a democratic society when everybody lives in fear? Yeah. When you live in fear to speak your mind, when you live in fear to to advocate your position. So it's yeah. it's really a terrible thing, and uh, it really is put, uh, I mean, the hope from the peace process is that all parties would be able to participate in the political process and people would be able to ex express their views. But uh, these killings and this violence uh, really puts a damper on that. And it really, it's really a, a huge, huge problem. But then you have this protest, uh, this recent protest against police brutality and against economic uh, crisis, and 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 you wonder yourself what might happen in Colombia. How, how do you see that? I mean, do you think there will be a change, or or this is just one of those these small explosions that happen from time to time, and then people go back to normal? Well, it's kind of hard to say, but um, I think that people are 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 were. Uh, very disturbed by the killing of that lawyer in the street. Yes, yes. And it was reminiscent of a killing in the United States. Mm -hmm. And there was like a, a small uh, sort of, uh, a, I'll call it an explosion of protest mm -hmm. in, uh, in Bogota. Bogota. Um, and uh, I don't know if this means there's going to be big changes or not. I would, we certainly hope so. But um, there may be less tolerance of this, uh, of the least of the police violence. Of course, the paramilitary violence is something that's hidden. 
Um, but the police violence is more, you know, police are off, they wear uniforms, they, you know, yes. they are in the street. Um, yes. And I think there is a, 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 there is a little bit of a reaction. I've seen some polls showing that the support from the, uh, the Uribe uh, party, the Centro Democratico, has shifted uh, more to the center. He's a, what we would call far right. Yes. And it's shifted somewhat to the center. Um, so, so I think whom? people are reacting. What's that? So where's whom? What party? Uh, sort what of the leader? Santos for me. Santos, wow. <laughs> that's sort bad. of towards it. That, that's it? like Gavira, jumping from, from, from It's <laughs> like, like in the US jumping from Trump to Biden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it, it, it show, but I, I think you're correct. <laughs> that's sad. You, I don't want to I don't want to get You're in trouble correct. with my liberal friends in the US but it's like come on <laughs> You're you're correct. However, I think it shows that some people are starting to reject the because they're the paramilitary violence is even though it ha it occurred when Santos was in power, don't get me wrong. Uh it's it's more seen as a problem of the Centro Democratico. So there may be a little there may be some reaction against that. That's all I'm saying. Um, and also you have go ahead no 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 finish because i wanted to i wanted to jump to the other questions but say what you wanted to say no 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 and the, the other thing we could talk about the peace process okay. all, all day so um, <laughs> okay no i just wanted to ask you the last question about the the violence uh, in the u.s and i believe that is very complex a very complex situation i mean because i believe that there's a mix of explosion and exhaustion of many people against racism but at the same time I see like there is like a there's about to start a civil war ignited mostly by the same Trump so uh, how do you see that I mean how do you see, and, and, and that is happening in the middle of, of uh, the biggest economic crisis the US is facing and and we are just at the beginning of that crisis. So, what do you think about that? Well, the the issue of police violence has always been there. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. And what is new? I mean, we 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 have like a thousand people killed every year by the police, approximately. So that's a huge huge problem. If you go to Germany, you know they may have five people in in five years killed by the police. Yes. yes. Yeah, but in a country like the United States. Um, in the United States, we have like a th almost a thousand, usually about around a thousand people a year killed by the police. What has changed is the people are seem no longer to be tolerating it. Um, That's nice. Because the, of the kill police killings, um, a, a, a disproportionate number are are, are black people um, for the size of their population. Um, and uh, also Latinos as well, but uh, particularly young black men seem to be a big target of the police in the United States. And now it seems like there's less tolerance of it. The people are not, uh, the young, especially young people. Because young people, I mean, you, you talk about the, it's, it's very complex. Um, you have this COVID thing. You have, at the same time, you have this economic collapse and it, 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 it may, not be a co it, it, it may just be a coincidence that this COVID thing and the collapse happen at the same time because the indicators is, is going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So you have young people who don't have jobs, whose universities are, are if they're not shut down, they're they're limited. Um, they're stuck in the they've been stuck in the house with lockdowns, and very frustrating for uh, young people. And they've been going out in the streets saying, "No, we're not going to allow you just to kill our our young black men at, at will." And they have the Black Lives Matter movement and other things. Um, so, I, in a way, it's a very positive. It's it's most it's a very positive thing that people are are, are, are focusing yes. on this police violence. Yes. Um, no, the problem, the limitations I see with it is not there's not a, a big uh, a group or big uh, direct uh, uh, political there. direction of the mm -hmm. young people. It's a lot of it is spontaneous. Yes. Um, but that is good. And on the other hand, uh, because of the economic crisis, uh, there, it is true that there have been emerging some sort of far right, uh, 
forces. Uh, people go out in the street with guns. Um, so I don't know if we're li looking to a civil war, but I think we're looking at more uh, more problems uh, than we had before. I think civil war. Like I think the civil war is, is 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 over the top, you know, because a lot of people they 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 make these things because they want to get rid of Trump, and so they say, well, if Trump stays, we're going to have a civil war, or we're going to have a coup d'état, uh, mm -hmm. etc. But um, so I think some of it is. But you don't uh, have a U.S. embassy there. That's the problem. Yeah, so we can't have a coup. <laughs> you cannot have a coup there. <laughs> we need to get a U.S. embassy, then we can have a coup. <laughs> <laughs> That's the old joke of always. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so yeah, there are certainly, uh, United States, the society here is certainly having some severe issues. And, uh, you know, there's a massive unemployment. Uh, we have, they say there's 8% unemployment. That's probably way undercounting uh, the amount of unemployment we have, probably much more. Uh, I think we had 40 million new unemployment claims due to the COVID, you know? Um, so we're looking at a, a very uncertain fu uh, near future. Uh, and the government really hasn't been reacting uh, uh, very well to it, you know? Neither party. I mean, I have to say neither party. Where, where, where's the proposal for a good health care for people? None. No. Where's the proposal for jobs for our young people? None. Where's the proposal to help with housing, uh, the housing there's, crisis? There's enough? actually no proposal None. at all. I mean, that this campaign no. is None. kind of like a uh, sui generi. I mean, it's like get Trump, Trump is bad. Get Trump or not get Trump or get out of Trump, yeah. uh, something like that. Trump is good or Trump is bad. That's mm -hmm. that's the whole campaign. Right. Um, yeah, but there's no there's no solutions put forward to the people. So I think we're going to be in for a sort of a stormy time. Do you see that? Who who do you think is going to win? You know, I think it's I I. Here's the here's the thing. Last time the the newspapers and the polls were saying that Hillary Clinton was going to win by a, what they call a landslide, uh -huh. huge victory. Well, she didn't. Um, and I have a suspicion, I don't really know, the, the polls say it's very close. I have a suspicion that uh, Trump, Trump, to me, does not, does not look panicked. He's not panicking, thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna lose. So I have my suspicions that Trump might win again. Uh, that's just because the Democrats, unfortunately, are not really uh, giving the people a lot of answers that they need. That's true. That's sad, anyway. Very sad. Listen, because we have. About Talking about violence, in recent days, maybe one or two weeks, there has been like this um, violent event in which media point at, at uh, Antifa or Black Lives Matters movement. And, uh, and, uh, and I believe that there's like, I don't know, I, I, I have the impression that, that they are like fabricating a case in the media, in the White House, whatever they do, those kind of things in order to to portray the, the protest as violent and try to uh, uh, illegalize uh, uh, the anti-fascist movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. How do you see that? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I see it as as uh, as if um, I was. Uh, how can I say? In my, in my, uh, when I was young, in my youth, we had the same issue with Nick, Richard Nixon. We had Richard Nixon saying, oh, the communists are in the street with the long hair and they're protesting the war. We need uh, order. We need order. <coughs> and a friend of mine once said to me recently, oh, maybe this, this Black Lives Matter movement will, will, will cause Trump a lot of problems. And I said, well, just remember what happened to Richard Nixon. He used that in, to his advantage to mobilize the more uh, right-wing forces in the country uh, behind him. That. I didn't know that. And, yeah, and Trump is doing the same thing. You hear him talk about Antifa, yes, yes. Uh, Black Lives Matter. You hear him so talking like a McCarthy. Yeah, anti-communist, yeah. like a McCarthy. Yes. And he's doing the same thing that Richard Nixon did. Um, and uh, to me, to my mind. I got it. So. That's bad news anyway. 
Well, yeah. we finished with my questions. Now I'm open to your questions. So if you have any yeah, questions, feel free to uh, yeah. ask them. I, I, have a, I have a question, and the, 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 the government in Venezuela was asking, was talking about uh, pardoning some uh, people from the uh, opposition who were uh, disqualified from running for office because of their uh, gold pista activities, their coup d'etat activities. Is that correct? I don't know why were they doing that. I mean, you, are you talking about the 100 something that Maduro pardoned a few weeks ago? Yeah. Or you are talking about yeah. a new one? No, 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 that one. Those ones, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Because if, <laughs> if he plans to do more of that, I mean, a lot of civilistas are going to be very mad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm but, behind. But, but anyway, but anyway, I, 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 if you ask my opinion about that, I, I share the, 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 I don't know how to say it in English. I share the, the rage of a lot of Chavistas that didn't like the, the Maduro's decision at first. But analyzing everything in context, especially after, I don't know, two or three weeks after the decision, you realize that, that, that there was a context for that decision. And right now when we are, you know, dealing in Venezuela with this fake, uh, independent UN uh, report about human rights in Venezuela, which is nothing less than a big lie because everyone in Venezuela knows, even the right wingers know, that human rights in Venezuela is not a problem. I mean, we have human rights issues like in any other country in the world, but uh, like, like, what make us different from many countries in the world is that in Venezuela, the bad guys in 99% of the cases are put behind bars. I'm talking about the police that commit abuses, torture or, or killings or whatever, extrajudicial killings, whatever bad things happen because we are human and bad apples are everywhere. In the case of Venezuela, those guys most of the times go to jail and, and they hide uh, authorities in the country from the president down, usually when we are in the middle of tough situations like the Guarimbas, the, 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 the violent protests that, that the right winger organized from time to time, uh, even in those cases, the highest authorities order in public speeches one day after day after day, the police forces not to use uh, live ammunition, uh, I use prop the proportional, you know, protocol of, of, of use of force, that kind of things. I mean, you know that in Venezuela, we don't have a, a, a human right issue like the one that you have in the U.S., for example. I mean, in the U.S., it's absolutely evident that the authorities from the president down do not care if a policeman kill especially black people or brown people, they don't care. I mean, and there's like a, like a, like an institution, institutionalized way to, uh, to let them free. So, so, so in, in, in that, that's why I believe that in that case, Maduro took the right decision, even though at the beginning, the first day when I was reading the news, I was like, ah, oh, come on, Maduro, why you did that? But uh, immediately, like like the same day, I believe, or the day after, I realized that it was a necessary decision for political reasons, for strategic international reasons. So I believe that the decision was uh, was right, if you ask me. I don't know if that was your question. Yes. Yeah, I, that was my question. I, actually, my question was why they did, what were the reasons they did it? I mean, if yes, you can give I me a short... Yes, I believe that, that, uh, it was, that the reasons were connected to inter the parliamentary elections and the negotiations within the, the, the national dialogue table, if you ask me. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and also, thinking internationally, I believe that they were connected in, in, in these kind of things. Uh, the governments usually know when bad news are coming. So I believe that the government also knew that this report, fake report uh, about human rights was coming. So maybe they took the decision thinking to, 
take it a step in at beforehand uh, the, uh, the 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 publicizing of the of the of the report. So there might be like other ones, other reasons that I'm not seeing, but at least those two ones are the biggest one, if you ask me. Can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. Wait, one more. <laughs> um, who's going to win the uh, uh, National Assembly on December 6th? Chavismo. Chavismo. I'm sure that Chavismo will win. Uh, uh, the, the opposition, I mean, there's a lot of people in Venezuela uh, that even among Chavistas that are unhappy with uh, the economical decisions and some of them with political decisions of Maduro government and what is happening in the country, especially the right wingers uh, uh, blame Maduro for what is happening and most of them tend to avoid or, or not uh, see uh, the, the real cause, causes of the economic problems that we are facing uh, in Venezuela, which many Chavistas uh, see as a result, directly result of U.S. sanctions. Uh, but disregarding what I'm saying, uh, the opposition is so atomized, so fighting among each other. It's like everyone against everyone. It's something crazy. I mean, there's I mean, they all hate each other uh, that I don't see uh, like they are going to be able to get enough strength to make to to make a change in the in the results of the of the of the parliamentary elections. So and in the other side, Chavismo is like a more united force, more amalgamated force. And we unite in the middle of the aggressions, and we are right now facing one of the biggest aggressions ever. So we, when the when the gringos start bothering us, Chavismo do like this. And I believe that that's what's going to happen in the in the parliamentary elections on December six. Uh, and of course, we're going to see in the weeks. Uh, we are seventy five days away from the elections, and. In Venezuela, uh, usually in these two months or three months before the elections, a lot of bad things start happening. Right now, we are dealing with a lot of uh, interruptions or, or, or worsening of public services, electricity, water, gas, everything, you name it. Uh, uh, we are dealing with that, uh, about, about problems with, uh, with, with those services. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we are going to see some violence from here to the before the elections, I'm pretty sure that we are gonna, I believe that the, actually the, they are the right wingers and the US are pushing in a worsening in the services to provoke some sort of protest. Actually a few days ago, I believe last week, there, were, there, were some, uh, there was a protest in Maracaibo because of the electric issues. So they are pointing toward that. And I believe that that might happen. I, I believe that, that they won't get enough uh, people to make those protests a real problem, but, but you can add to that that, that the gringos are also uh, in the Colombians, the Colombian government, and our same uh, deserters, our, our mercenaries that are deserted from the army and the police in Venezuela and are being trained in Colombia, they are capable of doing a lot of things. A few weeks ago, there was another gringo that the government is linking to the CIA, a, a former Marine that was captured very close to refineries in Venezuela. So, so, so I believe that we are going to see events like this in the, in, before the elections. But again, uh, Chavistas are already like very clear about who is the one be, uh, running the show. And when things like this happens, we are we already know. I mean, when, my sister is very anti-Chavista. She lives in Puerto La Cruz. She has been without water for like two weeks, something like that. Uh, and I, I decided not to talk to her in recent days because she's like, ah, I want to kill Chavistas. And she, of course, knows that I'm Chavista. So, so I prefer mm -hmm. <laughs> to avoid her. But I told her, listen, uh, merci. Is, is how, how I call her. 
uh, you know that these things happen every time we are before an election. Uh, so, so, so be prepared to that. We are going to be keep, you know, and, and which avistas are prepared also to that. I mean, we are ready to suffer problems with public services in the weeks to come. So, so, and, and that what, I mean, for me as a Chavista, that the only thing that that makes me is like wanting to vote more for Chavismo. You know what I mean? It right. makes me feel more anger against the right wingers or the U.S. So I will vote more easily against uh, anything that represents uh, right wingers or the U.S. government. So uh, the U.S. should know those things, but I believe that they are, I mean, the guys in Washington might be crazy or smoking something outdated or something. I don't know. <laughs> so the opposition loses. I think so, yes. I, if, I'm not sure. I, I believe that the, 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 the right wingers that are running in the elections are nice. Uh, at least they are, they are nationalistic. They are, they, they, they are against U.S. Uh, sanctions and that kind of things but they are not strong enough. And the other side of the opposition has managed to satanize them, to say that they are like co-conspirators with the Chavistas, that they are hidden Chavistas, whatever names they, they want to put at them. So they are in a, they, they, I, I believe that the, 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 the right wingers won't get more than, of, talking optimistically, more than 40% of the National Assembly, being optimistic. So let's see what happens. Things can change, I don't know. I mean, uh, these election things always change, especially in a country like Venezuela. But at least for today, I, be, I see like a result like 60-40, if you ask me. That's, that's quite a good victory. Yes, yes, it will be nice. It won't be perfect because for to be a perfect victory, we need like 66% of the National Assembly in order to do like to approve the, the kind of laws that are more important, that, that the, the laws that we call organic laws, or to appoint authorities for, 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 you know, branches of government like the Supreme Court or the Electoral Council, things like that. And those things will happen immediately after the the nation, the new National Assembly take office because uh, uh, the state is in depth. Uh, to appoint the way they should be the authorities in the at least in the National Electoral Council, and I believe that the next steps will be the the Supreme Court. So Very good. thank thank you for your questions. Those were nice questions, and thank you again for uh, accepting the invitation, Mark. I really hope that that you can uh, join uh, the the defense of Ilis Ramirez. And I really hope that we can, you know, organize like some international committee for the freedom of village, but also uh, for the freedom of, of, of Timon Trinidad. Of course. Thank you again. Thank you. And say hello to all my friends in Venezuela. I will. I will. Okay. Un abrazo. Abrazo. Bye -bye.